And good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Amanda, and the team at AHDP Dairy for inviting me here to talk to you today. So um, my name is Anne Mullen. Um, I'm a registered dietitian, something I'm very, very proud of. Um, my background is largely academic, so for the past 10 years or so I've worked as an academic in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine at King's College London. So that's by way of um, a plea for forgiveness if any of it gets a bit geeky, it's because I'm a scientist. Please feel free to uh, just ask me any questions at any stage. Um, if something needs clarification or if you need more detail, please just put your hand up and ask for it. Um, so what I'm going to do is just begin by introducing the Dairy Council. Um, Tom has already said a few words about what we do. Um, we work with AHDB Dairy on a research agenda and I'm going to overview that very briefly as well. Then we'll get down to the, the nuts and bolts of my presentation and the topic I've chosen to talk about today is dairy, saturated fat and cardiometabolic health. Uh, it's very hot topic in nutrition. It's also a very hot topic on the Daily Mail. Has anybody seen the press about saturated fat? Yeah, yeah we, we've all seen it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to put that a little bit in context. So to tell you a little bit about the dietary guidelines we have in the UK um, and locally actually about uh, dietary fat. We'll then go through some of the evidence base. So why is it a hot topic right now? Um, and this is something that I've been very busy with. Uh, over the past um, 18 or 16 months or so, with my team accumulating the evidence, getting experts working with us on generating an evidence base that we can present at the relevant time to the relevant people uh, for changing the dietary guidelines in the UK. And finally, the outlook. So the Dairy Council, very briefly, uh, we're a non-profit making organisation, we're a subsidiary of Dairy UK, and our remit is to address human health and disease issues that relate to dairy. We're staffed by registered dietitians and registered nutritionists, so we're all registered healthcare professionals. We provide information on the health benefits of dairy to consumers, healthcare professionals, media, industry, anybody who listen. We engage with opinion formers in clinical and public health, both at a national and at an international level. And uh, more recently, we've begun to facilitate dairy and human nutrition research in partnership with organizations such as AHDB Dairy. And I've listed here the five areas that I've been working on since I started at the Dairy Council. Um, cardiovascular disease or saturated fat, we're going to talk about that today. Obesity, hormones, healthy aging and environmental sustainability. And Ditta is going to take the lead on telling you about the work on environmental sustainability. So as I focus on cardiovascular disease um, in my presentation and Ditta focuses on environmental sustainability during the Q&A se session. If you have any questions about obesity, hormones, or healthy aging, I'm happy to take those questions too. So very briefly, uh, a little bit more about what the Dairy Council has always done. We were founded in 1920, and uh, we produce a whole range of publications for um, healthcare professionals and for consumers, and all our consumer-facing material holds the information standard. This logo, which means the NHS approve uh, our processes and all our content, so they consider us the most reliable source of information. We also put on a variety of events. This was World School Milk Day, events that we put on for children. I quite like translating science for a range of audiences. Uh, we've worked closely with the CBBs and the Children's BBC as well to put on events promoting nutrition and health, again for a very wide range of audiences. Uh, we've got a whole social media campaign called Milk and Crawl is Worth for teen audiences. Uh, we have a whole arm of our work in sports nutrition um, and Beth Twedden, before she had her unfortunate accident during the week on that Channel 4 programme, has been a great ambassador for the dairy industry as a whole actually. She, she's done some really, really good work promoting the benefits of milk and dairy in sports nutrition. The Dairy Council has a sports nutritionist of our own. Uh, we are a founding member of the British Dietetic Association's um, uh, register for sports nutritionists in the UK. Uh, you'll all probably hopefully be familiar with the milk race and in the most recent milk race we uh, had um, we worked with AHDP Dairy on providing that in Nottingham. Um, we, other, we do a whole range of public events such as the ceremony of Christmas cheeses um, and that's our kind of core work but with AHDP Dairy we've had this more academic and research agenda as I've mentioned and we've put on quite a few conferences recently um, in 2014, we had diet and um, sustainability at which Tita spoke. 
Uh, only two weeks ago, we held one on childhood obesity, uh, which is a very, very hot topic as well at the moment. We had some very high profile speakers and got quite a lot of press attention. Promoting the benefits of dairy in uh, maintaining healthy body weight, particularly in, in early childhood. And then last year, we had a series of very successful conferences on saturated fat and cardiometabolic health, which is what I'm going to talk about today. As I said, uh, it's a very hot topic. It's been in the press quite a lot. Um, I always go to the press when I want to find out what's hot or what's not uh, in nutrition. So in 2014, you may have remembered these kind of uh, messages, saturated fat advice is unclear, there's no link between saturated fat and heart disease. A dairy fat significantly reduces heart disease risk. Spread the word, butter is back in favor, but for how long? So dairy is a very, very hot topic and the saturated fat issue is complex and the reason why it, it, it's so interesting really is because um, of cardiometabolic disease. Um, I think I'll just take a couple of minutes to explain what I mean by cardiometabolic disease. Have everybody's heard of cardiovascular disease? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, cardiovascular disease is an umbrella term. It incorporates a whole range of things we'd be familiar with. Hypertension, stroke, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, arterial sclerosis, peripheral arterial disease. Now, coronary heart disease is uh, the leading cause of death in the UK. One in ten, sorry, one in six men, one in ten women die from coronary heart disease. But in fact, this umbrella term, cardiovascular disease, accounts for about 33% of deaths in the UK. If you uh, have the time to go into the socio-economic, geographical, and ethnic divides of spreads of cardiovascular disease in the UK, you'd be deeply shocked. Um, the socio-economic uh, influences on whether you die from coronary heart disease are shocking, your education, your income level. Geographically, unfortunately, the north of England is far more susceptible to coronary heart disease than the south of England. Ethnic divides, ethnic minority groups, um, Asians, um, Afro-Caribbeans tend to be more at risk. It's, uh, uh, prevalence rates have been falling over the decades in the UK, but the UK coronary heart disease death rate is actually higher than the UK or the EU average still. The other term that I want to draw your attention to is metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic syndrome is a syndrome, again, an umbrella term for obesity, insulin resistance, and that is a major risk factor for type 2 diabetes. And you'll know that type 2 diabetes is another hot topic in nutrition research. Um, there's over 2.7 million people in the UK, yeah, sorry, in England with type 2 diabetes, uh, and it accounts for a huge amount of spending on the NHS, mainly for avoidable complications. Type 2 diabetes is a major risk factor for coronary heart disease. They share some of the underlying pathology, if you like. So for that reason, we now refer to both cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome as cardiometabolic disease. They've got a similar etiology, similar risk factors, and actually similar things that can mitigate them. Um, so if I was to summarize the problem that the Dairy Council and AHDB Dairy and Dairy generally faces in terms of cardiometabolic disease, this is it, a simple, series of pictures. Um, for decades, fat has been called by many a risk factor for cardiometabolic disease, uh, mainly saturated fat. So uh, that's the first point. Um, there is debate over whether fat and saturated fat are risk factors for cardiometabolic disease, and I'll go into that in a few minutes. Our problem lies in that dairy, milk, cheese, and yogurt, and butter are a source of saturated fat. So naturally, they're targeted in these cardiometabolic campaigns to reduce risk at a population level. Now, that's a problem because milk, cheese, and yogurt contain a lot more than saturated fat. They contain a whole range of nutrients. They're very nutrient-dense and nutrient-rich foods, and we need to promote them. But they have been targeted, in my opinion, of unfairly in the fight against cardiometabolic disease in the UK. And maybe the manifestation of that fight is the eat well plate, I assume everybody knows about the Eat Well Plate. I'm not a fan, that's my own personal opinion. Um, I prefer something that tells me what a portion is and how many portions of a particular food group I should be consuming. And in fact, in the UK, the only real quantitative food-based dietary guideline we have is the five a day. There is no three a day in the official documentation from Public Health England for dairy. NHS website advises us that we consume some dairy. And for me, that's not a great strong message. So you can see that this, I think this slide summarizes the problems we have. The translation from the disease and mitigation in public health down to the public health message, which I think is inadequate. 
So the first assumption is that dairy fat is associated with cardiometabolic disease. Now, I'm just going to go through these slides quite quickly. They're, they're science-y, they maybe aren't um, uh, that easy to see down the back. But in the 1950s, there was a large epidemiological study, which means a study across populations, called the Seven Countries Study. Has anybody heard of it? Other than Ditta? No? <laughs> Okay, well, the Seven Countries Study is actually one of the major studies that informs our public health guidance in the UK today. It was set up in the 1950s by Professor Ansel Keith. Now, what the Seven Countries Study did, it looked at trends uh, between consumption of particular foods and disease outcomes. You need to bear in mind it showed associations, not causations. So what we see over here is total cholesterol was positively associated with death rates from coronary heart disease. In other words, in populations where cardiovascular disease was prominent, so too were high cholesterol levels. Kind of makes sense. What they also show down here is that total saturated fat intake was also positively associated with cholesterol. That kind of makes sense. Has anybody heard that from their doctor? Yeah. <laughs> when you put these two pieces of information together, saturated fat intake is associated with cholesterol. Cholesterol is associated with coronary heart disease, put one and one together and you get three. Um, the implication from this study was that saturated fat was associated with coronary heart disease. Now more recently that has been called into question and Siri Torino in 2010 produced this lovely meta-analysis. That's a kind of study where you pool together the, the results from all, or, sorry, a variety of other studies um, so you've got greater statistical power and Siri Torino et al. found no association between saturated fat intake and coronary heart disease or stroke, and that was in 2010. So that started to raise some flags about our um, understanding of saturated fat and coronary heart disease. More recently still, Rajiv Chowdhury um, showed a similar finding. Rajiv did another meta-analysis study, and Rajiv showed a few things that we would <coughs> expect. First of all, that fish oils were associated with a reduced risk. Has anybody heard that from their doctor? Yeah. They showed that trans fats were associated with a positive risk, and that makes sense. Trans fats, industrial trans fats, have been shown to be associated with coronary heart disease. That made sense. But what didn't make sense was saturated fat had no association with coronary outcomes. That's death from coronary heart disease. That caused, <coughs> excuse me, that caused a huge controversy, and that was where those newspaper articles came from. More recently, to see that all published something very, very similar where they showed that saturated fat intake was not associated with coronary heart disease mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, any of these outcomes of coronary heart disease. So our first assumption uh, that dietary fat is associated with cardiovascular dis or cardiometabolic disease, um, that assumption has been called into question with recent, um, recent uh, studies. And a very famous professor who I won't name in the UK, he says perhaps the seven country study and the fact that our public health guidance is based on that was eminence based rather than evidence based. In other words, the experts said it way back when, so we just they were the experts. Anyway, moving on from that, what Rajiv Chowdhury's study also showed in 2014 was that not all saturated fats were created equal. So we tend to use this umbrella term saturated fat but actually within that, it's a family of fatty acids and they behave differently. And of note, for these two fatty acids, which I've circled in red, marjoric acid and pentadecanoic acid, they're both exclusively found in dairy. If you find them in your blood, it's because you've eaten cheese, milk, or yogurt. You don't make them naturally. They're a biomarker of dairy intake. They were associated with a reduction in risk of coronary outcomes. Now, it's been shown uh, many times <coughs> Uh, sorry, no, it hasn't been shown many times, but it was shown um, in the early 2000s that saturated fats were a family that all behaved differently, and we can't consider them as one term anymore. We need to be a little bit more uh, intelligent about that. We need to think about saturated fatty acids rather than this family saturated fat. So our assumption that dietary fat is associated with cardiovascular disease, we need to reconsider that. Not all saturated fatty acids behave the same. And actually, Rajiv Chowdhury and others have shown that dietary fat isn't associated with uh, cardiometabolic disease, 
or rather risk factors. It's not a straight line like seven country studies showed. There's some subtleties there, but yet saturated fat as body may be associated with cholesterol. Cholesterol may be associated with disease outcomes, but you can't say saturated fat is associated with death from coronary heart disease. Moving on to our next assumption, that the dairy is a source of saturated fat. Therefore, dot, 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 you all know where this is going. Dairy has been targeted because of the saturated fat story, but the evidence doesn't support that at all. I'm just going to briefly run through some more meta-analysis. The first one uh, by Savita and Stima Muthu et al. in 2011, it showed there was a negative association between milk and cardiovascular disease. In other words, there was a reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease in her subjects who consume milk. In terms of coronary heart disease, Sabita Sedima Muthu showed no association between milk consumption and coronary heart disease. In terms of stroke, she showed uh, sig uh, no significant association, but a 13% reduction in risk of stroke in those who consume milk. And in terms of hypertension or high blood pressure, she showed a significant 3% reduction in risk if you consumed dairy products and the risk of developing hypertension. Chen et al, who's from the Harvard School of Public Health, who notoriously don't like dairy. Um, he did recently a meta-analysis and showed there was no association between dairy intake and type 2 diabetes. And the same study showed that with yogurt, there was a reduction in risk, a significant reduction in risk between consumption of yogurt and instant type 2 diabetes. So what this whole picture is showing you, I hope, is that dairy has either a neutral effect or a protective effect on what I'm calling cardiometabolic health. Does that make sense? So our assumption to dairy is a source of saturated fat, therefore, it just doesn't add up. It is a source of diverse fats. There is saturated fat, of course there is, but that includes those two fatty acids I mentioned, pentadecanoic and margaric acid, which have been negatively associated or inversely associated with risk. It also um, includes a whole range of polyunsaturated fats. The fats are not necessarily in high amounts. Now, Peter Elwood, who's an eminent professor from <coughs> Uh, Cardiff, he said just because we call it full fat milk doesn't mean it's full of fat. Actually, whole milk is not high in fat. If you go to the EU regulations um, about how to define a high fat food, milk is not there. So milk is not high in fat. Uh, low fat skin varieties are certainly low in fat. Milk, also, milk, cheese and yogurt also contain a whole range of other nutrients and ditto's mentors in Reading, uh, Julie Lovegrove and Ian Gibbons, have done a huge amount of research about the uh, milk matrix, if you like. So there's a whole lot of other nutrient, sorry, a whole range of nutrients in milk that give it a very complex matrix. And that matrix seems to moderate cardioprotective effects of milk, cheese and yogurt. So finally, we get onto the eat well plate, and that is for me the big challenge. We know we have a lot of evidence, we're accumulating that all the time, but when it comes to changing public health messages. I think that's where the Dairy Council and AHTB Dairy have a real challenge. So in terms of challenges, understanding saturated fat, fatty acids and their role in cardiometabolic health, we're getting there. Setting appropriate dietary guidelines for saturated fat and fatty acids, there's a lot of work to be done. Understanding the components of dairy that moderate cardiometabolic risk or promote cardiometabolic health, we're getting there, we're getting to the, the root of the evidence really. And setting appropriate dietary guidelines for milk and dairy through the Eat Well Plate or a revised version of the Eat Well Plate is a challenge. So in terms of setting appropriate dietary guidelines for saturated fat or fatty acids, in France, it's a very interesting um, scenario in France actually. Philippe Legrand presented at our recent saturated fat conference and what they have done is they've actually increased their saturated fat guidelines to less than 12% of energy. So in the UK, we're at, we should not consume more than 10% of our energy from saturated fat. So it's set at 10%. In France, they've increased that to 12%. And they said they've made um, exceptions within that. So they're considering saturated fat as a family rather than en bloc, as the French would say. So they said less than 8% or less than near equal to 8% of intake should be from those fatty acids that are considered deleterious when consumed in excess. In other words, they're saying there's some fatty acids there that, yeah, you need to restrict 
and saturated fat family, but don't restrict them all because they're not all the same. They behave differently. So France have uh, made very nuanced guidelines, if you like, and they've increased the actual guidance to less than or equal to 12 percent. Now, where does that leave us in the UK? Well, in light of Rajiv Chowdhury's work, D'Souza's work, and Siri Torino's work, and others, SAC, and who are our Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, is an independent group of experts who advise Public Health England. They have been called together, they've been assembled to review the evidence for uh, guidelines in the UK. This is a great thing. You're probably familiar with the fact that they've recently done it for sugar. You've probably heard about the sugar reports. And you see immediately the impact that is having in public health. There's a debate going on. So the first step is to make that evidence available to SACIN. Let SACIN do their independent review. And then it goes to the public. So I'm very hopeful for saturated fat in the UK because we're at the stage of SACIN gathering that evidence together. The challenge, as I said, is uh, getting the evidence there and to ensure the evidence is reviewed and published. And this is something that we've been doing with AHDP Dairy. We've gathered together groups of experts who've written those reviews and they're submitting them now for peer review and publication. In terms of the setting appropriate guide, dietary guidelines for milk and dairy, this is the translational part, and I think we have a huge challenge here. The sub challenge for the Dairy Council is making sure that consumers are made aware of the information on saturated fat, that healthcare professionals are aware, and that our public health work that's really engaging with the, the more wider political sphere, that that all goes ahead. So in terms of consumers and healthcare professionals, the Dairy Council and AHDB Dairy are putting together consumer and healthcare professional fact sheets. That's information on saturated fat, uh, part of metabolic health, and that'll be disseminated widely. I travel up and down the country talking to healthcare professionals. So I, I speak to dietitians, I speak to midwives, nurses, GPs, um, on an almost weekly basis. There's overwhelming support for dairy among healthcare professionals. I just want to say that now because I'm not sure that that's widely known. Um, all my material is endorsed by the British Dietetic Association. In other words, they've read it, they believe the evidence, and they support dairy. So there's a lot of uh, positive energy about benefits, nutrient benefits of milk, cheese, and yogurt um, among healthcare professionals in the UK. So, in terms of what we've done recently, as I said, AHDP Dairy and the Dairy Council are working on this project, Saturated Fat Dairy and Cardiovascular Disease, a fresh look at the evidence. We've held our three regional conferences, which were attended by healthcare professionals, and we had some excellent presentations from both national and international experts. We've got those two review papers for publication. They're written by national and international experts. The first review paper is on the role of saturated fat in cardiometabolic health. And the second, probably not a surprise, is on dairy and cardiometabolic health. In terms of translation, we've been doing a little bit of work with the press and quite a lot of work with social media. And also for translation, as I mentioned, those talks that I give to healthcare professionals, the fact sheets, the write-ups we get in healthcare professional press and the consumer fact sheets are all underway and um, happening. So um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, um, I'm very happy to take them on saturated fat or on any of the other projects that we're conducting. <laughs>